Hello Interwebs, welcome to Let's Fix Computers. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, I've recently started a second channel which is purely for extra videos and also where I'm moving the Two Guys Talk Tech podcast to. So if you watch my podcast, check the description down below for the link to my new second channel where that is moving on to. Uh, this is to help the algorithm stuff with the channel, yada yada yada. Podcast viewers, check the description down below. Thank you very much. Right, uh, today we are going to be taking a look at the CH341A mini programmer. Um, this is a very popular little BIOS chip programmer. Um, I've had this one for quite a while now. I haven't been using it as my main uh, because there's a problem with this. I'll tell you more about that as we go in. Now, before I go any further into this, I also want to give some props to uh, where I'm getting my references from today. This video is going to be heavily referenced from another video uh, by a channel called Voltlog. I will link their video in the description down below as well. Thank you very much, Voltlog. I more or less followed your video to a T when researching this one. It was a very good video that I thought explained the problem and the solution incredibly well. However, lots of people, they kind of like to hear things from a voice they're familiar with. So here's me, here's my take on the whole thing. Anyway, I will link to all of my resources in the description. All the references are there. Thank you very much for the people who've done the hard work for me. So let's talk about this programmer. Um, so the usual programmer that I have been a, uh, um, a favor of recently is the uh, RTA209F serial programmer. This is the guy that I use as my main. It has pros and cons. Um, but if you are working on a budget, this CH341A mini programmer is really heckin' cheap. Like seriously cheap. They're like five or six dollars kind of cheap. Um, however, it has a critical problem. The main chip on it is run at five volts. Now it has a 3.3 volt regulator that puts a 3.3 volt supply to the device being programmed. However, because the data lines of this programmer go back to the CH341A chip, it means the data lines are pulled up to five volts, which is bad. That's too high for the chips that you're programming. Now, most of the time it will be okay because the data lines aren't actually conducting any power they're just simply being uh, pulled up or, or shorted to ground as signal wires, which I think is why you don't immediately blow stuff up with this. But it's absolutely not good for the chip at the very least. Now, I don't know how much of a threat that actually is because I've used this on a couple of chips already myself before I knew about the fault and not had any problems. However, because there is a straightforward fix available, we'll demonstrate that today. So firstly, let's demonstrate the problem. So if I plug this into a power bank, just so it's powered up, and I'll just pull out the camera slightly so you can see my multimeter at the same time. I'll put my multimeter into volts. And firstly, we can check that from the USB port, we have five volts. So there's our five volt supply. And then powering the chip itself at its VCC pin in the top right, there's our five volts again. Then over here, we've got the 3.3 volt rail, which is our regulated 3.3 volts. And that is going to the VCC pin of the programmer, which I think is there. There it is. So the chip itself is powered by 3.3 volts. However, the data lines, which I can probe from down here, whoops, are at five volts. So that's the thing. The chip itself is being powered at 3.3 volts, which is fine, but the data pins are connected back to the programmer chip, which is pulling up to 5 volts. That's the issue. So the solution to this is to do a modification where we uh, reroute the power. So this guy, instead of being powered directly from the 5 volt rail, is being powered on the 3.3 volt rail. And this guy's quite happy to run at 3.3 volts. It can work within that range. And if we do that, it then will be outputting 3.3 volts to the chip. So what we have to do is we have to lift that pin in the top right so it's no longer contacting the pad and run a jumper wire over to the 3.3 volt rail. There's also an extra pin down the side here, which I'll point out in a moment, which also needs to go over to the regulator uh, in order to um, stabilize everything as well. So let's go over to a schematic of this device just so I can show you what that looks like. 
So this web page is on onetransistor.eu um, and they have reverse engineered this thing and provided a full schematic. I'll link to this page in the description down below. And you can see up here that uh, if we zoom into this, here we go. So VCC pin 28, that goes back to the five volt rail here, which is all linked back to the USB port via this zero ohm resistor, which is essentially a fuse. Um, so we need to lift this pad and we're going to redirect it to the 3.3 volt rail from this regulator here. And when we're running it in this configuration, uh, this pin here, V3, that also needs to go to the 3.3 volt rail too. And then it also has a bypass capacitor that is bypassing it to ground. So we need to run two jumper wires. Uh, now this does require running some very small jumpers, but it's not a huge amount of work. And if you're practicing micro soldering like I am, then it's actually a really good practice to do this. Because the device is so cheap as well, it's not really the end of the world if you butcher it. So I'm gonna start by adding a little bit of flux onto that pin. Eh, a loop. And a little bit of fresh solder to reflow it. Uh, let's see, I've got to figure out how to get in here. Eh. I'm not very good at small soldering, by the way, so do forgive me. There we go. Now what I want to do is lift that pin. So I'm going to grab a pair of tweezers. And I might just turn this all around so I do it from this angle, which I think will work for me. And I need to flow that joint and just get my tweezers underneath that leg to lift it up. I think these tweezers are much too big. They are. Where are my other tweezers? There they are. How about these boys? No. Okay, I'll tell you what. I'm going to get a Stanley blade under there instead, I think. I'm doing a terrible job at that. I'll put it in this vise. And then I don't have to try and hold the thing steady while I work on it. That's better. Right. That pin has lifted. I'm just going to tidy up the uh, solder blob I've left behind there. There, and from that angle, you can see that this pin is now floating up in midair. So now I'll apply a little bit of alcohol just to tidy up that flux, and then I'm going to put a little square of captain tape underneath it just to isolate the pad. There we go, I gave the board a better wash without having it mounted up and then my uh, captain tape has stuck down properly. So now we've isolated that pad. So now we need to run power from this pin back to the 3.3 volt regulator, which is here, so the center pin, or this guy up here will also do. Uh, so we're going to run a jumper wire from here around the outside to there. So the wire I'm going to use for my jumper is this enamel wire, also known as magnet wire. Um, and it's just copper wire with a enamel coating on it. Uh, this is 27 AWG in size. And just to give you some perspective of what that looks like, as you can see, it's about the same size as the pins that we need to join up to. Uh, and I'll just grab my calipers actually, so you can see how wide it is. So that is half a millimeter wide. And to use this stuff, we've just got to scrape off the enamel from the end. So I'm just going to do a little bit of scraping on my uh, scraping pad here. There we go, that's working quite well. A craft knife is a bit more apt for this, but use whatever you've got to hand. Right, I'm now going to flux my wire. I'll just poke that into the flux syringe and add, I'm going to tin it. And then hopefully I won't need to add any solder 
onto the surface. All of my flux has just run down the wire, so that was awesome, I guess. Okay, here goes nothing. There we go, that's on good enough, I think. There's a little bit of a stray solder wisp there, but I'm not aiming for uh, I'm not aiming for show quality here. Right, I'll now use my tweezers just to guide this guy around. And we're going down to there. There we go. I'll just tidy up that joint a bit. That's fine. Okay. The wire was a little bit long, but I think that's okay. I'm going to touch up that join. Watch me regret this. No, that went well. That looks tidier to me. I like that. Good. Right. Now we need to get another jumper from pin 9. So that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That guy there below the 3. So it's right up with the edge of the, um, uh, of the regulator. So I've just trimmed off another tiny little jumper wire. Uh, again, I have been told by others or advised by others that it's not a good idea to trim your wire to length. You should lay it down and then cut it off the reel as you go. Um, however, for these really short runs like this, I think this is easier for me. Um, but just keep in mind, this is not necessarily the advised way of doing it. I suggest experimenting with different methods and seeing what works for you. Okay, here goes. Flux. I tell you what, I could be running a much smaller tip than this. People have recently been asking me what soldering irons I'm using. I actually run two irons at the moment. I have a uh, TS100 and a Pine Sill, which are very, very similar. Um, they both run off barrel jack DC inputs. The Pine Sill can also run on Type C power delivery. Uh, the reason why I have them both on the desk is I've got one of them with a wedge tip in and the other with a BC2 micro soldering tip in. And for me, it's a lot quicker to just pick up the other iron and swap the power cable over than it is to swap out the tips. So I've literally just put down the TS100, picked up the pine saw, and within 30 seconds, this thing's up to temperature. Oh my word. Could you stop? There we go. Can you tell I haven't done this much yet? Oh no. Could this jumper wire stop going everywhere except where I want it to? There we go. Now we'll just drown it there. Uh, 
this is probably a bit big for the micro soldering tip now. I'm just going to switch back. There we go. Right, it's not as neat, but it's certainly good enough. Hats on. Let's clean that up. Hopefully I won't sweep away my nice little bit of captain tape here. I bet I will. There we go, like I bought one. So, what we've now done is we've now changed it so the CH341A chip is being powered from the 3.3 volt rail. We've also uh, changed pin 9 to be up at 3.3 volts as well, uh, which I think it's some kind of programming or set pin to tell the, uh, the chip what kind of mode it's in. Um, we have not needed to lift the pad at pin 9 because that just goes to ground via a bypass capacitor. So we don't need to touch that one. This one we needed to lift though because that pad is where the 5 volts is coming in through. So that's where we've disconnected it from. Good, right, let's plug this in and we should find that our voltages now look correct. So we should find that this guy is now getting 3.3 volts, which it is. The chip is still getting 3.3 volts, but now more importantly, the data lines are now being pulled up to 3.3 volts instead of 5 volts. So this guy is no longer setting the data pins to the device under test to 5 volts. So, mission success. As a finishing touch, we could get some conformal coating and put it over those wires just to put a nice little lacquer layer over the top. I don't actually have any to hand yet, so I'm not going to do that now. However, I would recommend getting some conformal coating of some kind. Even if it's just some uh, clear nail varnish will probably do the job. And that just makes sure that those wires don't get snagged at any time. But, you know, if you're putting an adapter in there and you accidentally snag the wire and rip it off, you're going to be very sad about that. However, thankfully, these wires are not too exposed on this, so that looks just fine to me. I'll probably do that at a later date. So that's all I got for you today. Uh, I will be doing a follow-up video to this where I'll show you guys how to install the software, use it, and actually use this device to reprogram a BIOS chip. But I'm going to save that for another video just so we don't end up with a big old one-hour marathon. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, as usual, my support links are in the description below for my Patreon, Discord, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, and remember to give the video a like because that tells YouTube that you want to see more content like this. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.